Welcome back, friends. Today I'm in a crazy basement in uptown Minneapolis with a mm. guest who invited me into this creepy little space, uh, oh, who just creepy. got back from... <laughs> It's a whole vibe. <laughs> uh, who's from the Midwest, but was just touring all of Europe, um, but just got back. And thankfully, we were able to, able to connect over Instagram. And here I am. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Emma Dahlenberg. Yeah. Hi. How's it going? Oh, Thanks. so good. Good to, good to be here. Good yeah. Well, it's your house. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice, cozy morning. You're just drinking coffee. And yep. Chatting. Yeah. Waking up 15 minutes before I get here. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds... I, I just got to go down into the cave in the basement, you know? It, it was... sounds about right. How long have you lived in this cave? Um, Since September this last year, so not too long, uh, yeah. but have, have made good use of the space in the short amount of time for sure. So who are you and what are you passionate about? <laughs> okay, um, I am Emma and I am passionate about uh, making things lighter, I would say why um you know in a humorous way right. uh, i realize out of context what i just said sounds insane uh, well, yeah i brought lighting we're, we're lit up <laughs> <laughs> um why he said yeah i i, do, I feel like like um you know, i've just had some stuff happen personally where i i needed that for myself and like i'm i'm, I'm happy that like i grew up in a way where like having a, a sense of humor has been yeah, he's like a coping mechanism in some ways and just like a way like a like a framework of like looking at the world and yeah. I like that I can share my experiences through that lens and then it it seems to other people like it. They yeah. resonate. They're like, "Ah, I feel the same way." And I'm like, "Good. Cool." Yeah, of all the clips that I watched on Instagram, I would say I think that's the best part is when you're making light of a situation that is honestly pretty dire, like kind of horrible, yeah. but you make it really funny. Like I was I saw that joke where you're talking about the she they thing, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, um with gender identity and you relate it to Scooby Doo and the different characters, <laughs> which is hilarious. Uh but in reality, especially in like today's world, that's like a very difficult thing for a lot of people that causes a lot of well, I, yeah, I don't even know how to say it. I guess causes a lot of really deep depression and worse things than that because people yeah. struggle with that because there's so much on the opposite side of the spectrum that are telling people like, no, you're one or the other. You have to be what you were born as. Like, like there's something wrong with you. Right, exactly. <laughs> and it, it's a serious issue, but you uh, you turned into something relatable and hilarious. So I appreciate that. I um, think like, it's just like, I, you know, nothing is that serious is kind of where I'm coming from where it's like, come on, you guys. it's like really not that big of a deal and it's fun to put things in terms that make it not that serious like let's just talk about scooby-doo to make this yeah. make sense for you yeah absolutely <laughs> so let's talk about why you had a dark past i know that's like jumping into something really deep but you're from uh when i read like on your bio on your website it says that uh you grew up in a trailer park and then i heard you were in winona is that where the trailer park was yeah yeah only until i was 12 i uh only 12 years <laughs> you were in a trailer park <laughs> only <laughs> okay that's like barely half a decade no, barely <laughs> and you're um, 25 right yeah so like half your life <laughs> <laughs> um i uh yeah you know winona is like a good city it's like a small town in um i guess yeah listeners probably know winona because it's like yeah a, what's the population in winona uh twenty seven thousand. Oh, okay yeah. yeah so it's pretty small yeah yeah how um, far away from eau claire is that I think it's like an hour and a half okay about. it's not too far is it a little south of minneapolis or what direction do you drive yeah it's like two and a half hours south from so how is it only an hour from eau claire if it's south maybe and it's still... more i don't know i'm just yeah okay. well fair <laughs> it enough could definitely be more maybe i'm just like thinking the geography of both states and i'm yeah. like when i drive to minneapolis well, i'm going like pretty triangle. much straight yeah, 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 yeah. it's like Min minneapolis and then eau claire and then winona sure Okay, so anyway, so Winona, were your parents and stuff originally from Winona, or like, yeah. why were you in Winona in the first place? Yeah, yeah, uh, my family, like my my mom and dad, um, they met in high school. Cool. Uh, fifteen, they started when they were fifteen, started yeah. dating, um, and then uh, got knocked up when they were like nineteen. Cool. So quick. Nice. And, and Effective. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we didn't have much like family in Winona. Like when I was born, like my grandma and grandpa moved to Connecticut when I, like, they just like up and left. Born. Yeah. They were like, you guys need to figure this out on your own. Oh no. And my other grandma's kind of crazy. So she wasn't and then the other, other grandpa, not around. Sure. So it was just you and your very young, young parents in a trailer. So yeah, it was weird. dude. <laughs> <laughs> 
like, I mean, I don't even really, you know, don't remember it too much, but based on how I am now, it had, it had to have been weird. Yeah, I guess so. But I think being born from the struggle puts you in a better position to be like, or to be able to relate to other people in different yeah. kind of ways. You know what I mean? I think people who come from privilege, like me being a white male who is very middle class, <laughs> can't really relate to the situations that a lot of people are in. And yeah. I try to be as open minded about it as possible and go, man, that sounds horrible. And I can't. I can't understand what you're going through, but there's a lot of people that don't view it that way and just think, well, you should just work harder. Like you should just yeah, not be shitty. It's like, well, pull up your bootstraps. Yeah. I yeah. can't afford bootstraps. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, sure. Okay. So earlier on though, you, uh, cause comedy came super, super late. Well, uh, in, in the time frame of your life that you've been alive, <laughs> it's uh -huh. been more recently. You were into sports and stuff, uh, growing up, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What sports? Uh, I played basketball, softball, and soccer. Which was your favorite? I, you know, I would say basketball uh, was my favorite for sure. Um, it injured me, um, but I have uh, let go of the, the grudge. You like lost a championship and your heart broke or how did you get injured? <laughs> no, I blew out my <laughs> knee uh, and have had um, pretty bad long-term effects from the knee injury. Um, they, they had something, you know, about you know, being poor and getting hurt medically pretty bad and then just being like well i guess we're gonna try to figure this out um but have it you know it, so yeah when i was 16 i i tore my acl and my meniscus um 16 or 17 and i was able to like come back and start playing basketball again but like my knee was just like i knew like I, when i started trying to play again i was like this is not i don't think this is gonna work and i tried to play in college um but like first game in summer league i like tore something again and it was a meniscus so i had to get another surgery and then a year and a half ago i had to get a meniscus transplant oh. um so i've got like a I do a joke in my show where i'm like yeah it talks to me every day but don't worry you guys it, it only takes a year to get over a demon <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't recall ever having a demon when i got uh, all the <laughs> hamstring tissue put into my shoulder when i had that reconstructed oh uh, was it was it like don donor yeah, hamstring? I, yeah they didn't take it out of my leg <laughs> yeah so i have well, they can do that they can take sure. hamstring out of your leg and put it in your knee well when i woke up my leg was intact so <laughs> <laughs> you're like what is this big scar on the back of my uh, leg i'm pretty sure that it's fine <laughs> <What'd> you <guys> <laughs> <do>? <laughs> so you guys do so you play it all through high school um why'd you move to i'm assuming you must have came to minneapolis then for college yeah that's why mm -hmm. you came here yeah yeah did you get on a scholarship to play d1 women's basketball is there a d1 <sighs> women's basketball yeah, at the U of M. Okay. Um, Twin Cities. No, my knee. Dude, I mean, I wasn't even like, I think I, I, you know, I was like getting good and I'm like tall is like very tall and like, you know, I, I think I could have been good if I didn't fuck my knee up. When Can you I was, dunk? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's like four women in the world who can dunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're, I'm you're, one of them. <laughs> you're like six, six, one. So, but what did you come here for? I mean, a lot of people in Eau Claire too, like Minneapolis is like your eyes get wide of, oh, there's so much opportunity, the party, there's so many cool people, all this mm. thing, blah, blah, blah. I got to move there. Um, and a lot of people don't really move with a plan necessarily. They go yeah. to college for like generals. Is that kind of what you did? Yeah. I, cause I, I played like D3, like I wanted to play D3. So I went to Hamlin university. Um, and then like that very quickly, uh, you know, the knee, um, I was like, well, this isn't happening, I guess. Uh, and I was like really into like psychology and neuroscience. Um, and then I was really into drugs uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the psychology and neuroscience took the back seat. Cause I was like, I'd rather experiment with consciousness firsthand. Um, Rough time. Not rough time, you know, but it was fun. It was really a really good time. And then I transferred to the U of M and I started doing graphic design and uh, kind of got my shit together. And then I started doing stand up. Yeah. Wow. The U of M took the druggie in. That, yeah. that was, uh, did you put that in your portfolio of like, I know I, I, I blew it in basketball at this small university and I haven't really cared about anything other than drugs but you want to take me on i thought it was hard to get into that school that's the misconception i cared about everything and a drug you know what i mean it wasn't <laughs> i was very deep in care i didn't i hadn't tuned out i was actually tuning pretty deeply in i think um but to uh you know i there was like drawings in my portfolio that were like <laughs> obvious what was happening sure like aliens and um a aliens lot of real angular line work i would say if that makes sense <laughs> yeah i think i think a lot of people can uh, relate and understand what you're talking about so you went to school though for graphic design 
yeah I, for a bit and then i switched back to psychology oh okay why'd you want to do graphic design were you ever into art before are you into art currently yeah i've always like been into art i draw when i feel like it like on trains and stuff or do you actually like... i was super into graffiti and stuff when i was a kid for sure i was like a, oh. i was a bridge i was a i, I was like a, a troll i'd say <laughs> But like the real troll, I was not online. I was under bridges. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean the only thing I've ever been arrested for is graffiti. <laughs> That's why the trolls can't get me, dude. Like the trolls online, y'all can't get me because I am a real troll. I catch <laughs> catch me under a, under a bridge and then we'll talk. Okay. Do you still do graffiti? Uh, I will. Yeah, I I did kind of recently, um, for the first time in a while. Now that you have nothing to lose, right? Because if you got in the news for it, it'd be like, oh, a local comedian. You're like, cool, this is a little bit it's of promotion being for me. After like spray painting like a vagina on a thing. Yeah, that'd be I awesome. mean, it could go viral. Like that that would, cool. it actually would work. <laughs> That's gonna be my new my new marketing scheme. I'm just gonna try to get arrested. Uh, yeah, I mean it would probably work, honestly, in today's world. So you were I going to school would. for uh graphic design. You just quickly decided that doing artwork for a brand that isn't any like doesn't have creative freedom is not fun at all. And then you decided to get into psychology instead? I, kinda what I, I liked graphic design, but I started to I started to really like stand up because I started doing stand up when I was in college and then I started to just be like I don't want I because I had like a, enough like psychology and like credits from my to, to graduate because like the, the way that like the u of m design school is laid out it's kind of it's kind of dumb dude like they make you like do stuff in an order okay. where it's like i'm not going to be able to graduate for another like two years versus if i just like take a degree in psychology i can graduate now so i decided to do that it wasn't really a passion or career choice because i didn't um care about it anymore I but you finished school still comedian yeah you got a bachelor's degree yeah how is it i yeah i guess i don't understand how a bachelor's degree can have two years difference um based on what credits you take but yeah it's like a, uh, you know just like technicalities like with the school like it weird sure. it doesn't make sense did you have to get it. way into debt doing that oh yeah i'm fucked oh, okay cool <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful yeah. part is when you get uh when you work for yourself it's hard for people to garnish your wages right yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they can't get you yet definitely killer so how did you i mean you've told the story before but keep it brief how uh -huh. did you get into stand-up um I was uh, I was working at Applebee's. I don't Sick. know if I've thrown in this detail before. I was working at Applebee's. Um, I was like dating the bartender, um, which was like a good time. Um, and you were wait staff. Yeah, I was a server. Okay. Uh, and he decided to like he was like, oh, I'm gonna go do an open mic. I'm gonna do stand up. And I was like, what? I didn't know you could, cause like I had a friend, um, my roommate's friend in Chicago was doing like stand up in Chicago, and I was like, would always like talk to we, we would like facetime him together and i would like pitch jokes at him so it's like i was like i was like i want to do this but you know it didn't i didn't know that i thought you had to be in like new york chicago or la so my ex-boyfriend was like i'm gonna go do stand-up i was like i think i'm gonna try it too and uh he he wasn't happy that it <laughs> one of us was better than I, I was just like sorry man awesome yeah do you know dina hashem uh she's a comedian in new york but she's got a uh amazon special comedy special out and... yeah i think i just listened to her on mark Maron, yeah she maybe. was just on mark yeah. Maron. so mm -hmm. i interviewed i interviewed her when she came through um because she performed cool. in uh, well actually perf i met her when she performed in eau claire but i couldn't make it to the show she just happened to come into my skateboard shop because her boyfriend skates oh cool, cool which was really random like <laughs> i talked to her boyfriend for like an hour mm -hmm. and then finally towards the end of the conversation I was like, why are you guys in Eau Claire? And he's like, oh, she's performing. It's like, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then they left. And I'm like, who in the world would be here from New York? So I like had to Google online to figure out like, who is that? Uh -huh. And then found out, oh, there's this like pretty big comedian that was just kicking it in the store for an hour that I didn't even really talk to. Oh, that rules. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So then I DM'd her right away. And I was like, we should do an interview. She's like, I don't have time. It's like sick. <laughs> so we kept in contact. But anyways, uh, the reason I brought it up is because her story was similar. She um, wasn't dating the guy, but it was just some dude she had a crush on that yeah. wanted to go do stand up. So she decided to like, oh, they did. I think they did like a skit together or something, but she was way funnier. And then yeah. she ended up like winning this like open mic right away after that. And that relationship didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I think anybody who starts doing stand up is in a fragile state. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But I think part of it, though, is just she was in a similar uh, mm. mindset of like not being aware that that's something that you even can really Yay. pursue, you know? And it's like, I, I don't like like the, like, you know, it wasn't, 
in like in both these cases like i feel like it's almost like a common thing for uh like it's like there's so there's not that many women like right. like you know still i mean like like there's like more than ever you know yeah. but like stand-up has been like traditionally like dominated by by men always so it's like i feel like there's more avenues for like men to hear about these things happening so yeah. it's like I'm, I'm just like happy that it just happened to be along and it was yeah. just like i, I want to do this do anybody can sign up i'm gonna do it yeah. yeah well i think part of the the thing is just male privilege in general that people don't always recognize but for me i look at it as like there's there's nothing really out there other than like some you know individual sports or, or something um but there's really nothing out there that the general public would assume i can't do yeah right there's the assumption that well i'm a white male so like if anyone can do it i probably could like there's no reason I couldn't because yeah. I am in the most privileged position to do so. Uh-huh. Even with like opening a skateboard shop, it's like if especially when I opened it ten years ago, it's such a male dominated industry, and that's changing too. There's but things still. that we think that white men can't do. <laughs> <laughs> sure, <laughs> but I'm just saying that the the difference as far as like in in my own mind with other people around was like there's nobody telling me well you can't do that versus yeah. I think with women there's a, a a lot more barriers in place of like people just not. I guess not putting you in the position of like, well, why wouldn't you do that? I think you have to go after it a little bit more. Yeah. Dude, Jimmy Johns won't hire me to be a bike driver, to be a bike delivery sandwich person. And I'm like, well, really? you think I don't, I bike everywhere. I, I noticed as soon as I walked in, the man was just like, ah, you can't bike. <laughs> You're a girl. <laughs> what? Like, I bike all the time. Yeah. It's real. Well, yeah. Well, for, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that one, but that's, yeah, that's, that's why I struggle. That's my gender inequality moment. I'm like, really? I want to deliver sandwiches by bike so bad, but yeah. you won't let me because you don't believe that uh, my, my muscular structure is the same as a man and I can't do it fast enough. Well, I mean, at least you can, <laughs> not fast enough to keep these cold sandwiches still cold, I guess, for room <laughs> temperature. Um, <laughs> dude, I saw someone, I don't know what it was. It was online or something. Of course, you see everything on there, but um, somebody said something along the lines of like, if the Beatles came around today no one would give a shit it was like i don't know if that's true at all (laughs) they're like well there's just way more competition they're not that good i was like "Eh, i don't i think i think they still would (laughs) if a song can just make me cry you know that's that's power Uh, yeah so is that what you try to do with your comedy is make people cry um from I, laughter <laughs> more so yeah yeah <laughs> if someone cr- i love a uh, slap the knee if i see that happen in the audience i'm like i'm crushing man when people are having spasms <laughs> in their body that's what i want i want people to be spastically laughing like, hearing Ooh. people just wheeze <laughs> okay so your first comedy uh, uh performance went relatively well better than you would have expected so how did it kind of go from there um, I mean, I wouldn't even say it went, well, I guess, you know, better than expected is that I did it. You know, yeah, my expectations sure. for myself were pretty low when I first started doing stand up. I didn't, I really just doing it. I, I was like, no way, dude. You did it? Like, yeah. I was on stage. I have a video of myself, like, my first stand up set. I'm like, I have a whole notebook just like shaking <laughs> as I'm reading jokes about, like, yeah, the jokes were ridiculous. Um, but yeah, it was a real slow build. I think it took me some time to figure it out. Yeah, but you've been, you've only been doing stand up for like four years or something. Five years, yeah. Five years still, and I mean, I know it wasn't glamorous, but you were just on tour through Europe, so I mean, it wasn't like that crazy slow of a build. It must have gone relatively well. I guess, yeah, maybe. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I guess. You know, in like, the grand scheme of things, anyways. I think I have a a pretty like I don't feel like I'm good yet. Yeah, imposter syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people struggle with that. Definitely. Okay, so how long were you doing stand-up before you decided or you even had the inkling of maybe this could actually be a career? Um, I think, like, it was, I moved to Germany um, in, like, 2021, 20, I think, uh, for, like, a cultural exchange program. And I was going to go there for, like, a year. And I was kind of trying to, like, live in Berlin. And, like, I was still, like, at that time being, like, maybe I want to get into, like, like I had done like a, I was like working in like advertising, like I did like a copywriting internship at Best Buy. Then I was like, oh, okay, I could do this. This is kind of fun. But, you know, I was still like stand up was like, but I just didn't view it as like, I was like, I'm never going to make money from this. This is something I do for fun. Uh, and then I moved to Germany to kind of try to do career stuff. And then when I got there, I just, I couldn't, I could only do stand up like twice a, a week, like yeah. in the city that I was in. Um, and I like realized then with it being kind of gone like how much it meant to me and then i uh like as stuff started kind of happening in germany i was meeting people in berlin i was able to like 
just jump between Berlin and Amsterdam and Basel and Cologne and these cities. And I was like starting, I was like making like money, like producing like my own like shows and stuff. And people were like booking me to do long amounts of time because in Europe it's like a, it's a quicker timeline. Like when someone does their first show in Cologne, like yeah. they get seven minutes, like their first set ever. It is like in here you get three minutes. So it's just like, that's kind of like the time to like, you're allowed to do more time. I think earlier in your career in Europe is kind of what I've seen. Um, is it because there's less competition or why? Yeah. I think less competition and more of like a story based okay. like art form. Like it's like people like, I mean like it's in Berlin, like people are like, like tight, like they do like, like they could you know like do well and like but like it's like uh there's like the the kind of edinburgh fringe like everybody's doing like an hour like telling their their life story and you want to get like you dig deep and be emotional whatever so it was like <laughs> sure. i was able to kind of i don't think i could have done an hour in the u.s when i did an hour in europe so it, it was a nice shortcut like i got lucky with just like happening to be there and realizing i could do this sure. in their way um before i could do it in the u.s way and I was like, oh, this is like a real career. Like, I'm like making money, you know? Right. So, so, and then I ended up getting like deported from Germany because, you know, I was making money illegally. I was not, right. <laughs> I did not have a visa and I was not paying taxes on anything I was doing. So, um, you know, I was doing it the wrong way then. Uh, so I don't remember where I'm going with this. <laughs> so you went, you went as an exchange program when you were a graphic design student still? Uh, is that how it was? I had graduated. It was like a post-grad kind of U.S. government sponsored thing. Oh, okay. Because I think I guess I thought by going over there as an exchange program that wouldn't give you the freedom to just be going between countries yeah, it, and cities. It didn't, and that's why I got in trouble. Oh, because <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't. I was like, I don't want to do what they're having. It was wild. It, my my whole like my set that I'm working on really dives into the story. But it was like a you know they placed you with a host family, and my situation was like in, insane. I tried to I tried to do the school program, and it didn't work. So I was just like, fuck it, I'm just gonna tour. So you just stayed. How did you even get set up to go to these different cities? How did you meet the people where you stayed, or the people who own the clubs, or the bookers, or any of that? Like, where did that come from? It's a lot more like ground level in Europe, like self produced. Like, there's not like a like. You know, like in the U.S., like there's like all these chain clubs and everybody's like managers and booking agents and stuff. In Europe, it's like Wild West comedy. Like you just have to know other comics and then they tell you kind of like, oh, yeah, this venue is open at this time or whatever. So it's like I started doing stand-up in Cologne, Germany. Um, and there was like there's like a community of like 30 comics. There, is this like an open comics. mic situation or what? Yeah, it's like an open mic. And then they have a few book shows through the month and stuff. And then okay. but then I would go to Berlin. And when I was in Berlin, that's when I was like. I, I would just meet so many people because it's like Berlin's almost like a you can do like four sets a night in English. Oh, wow. It's okay. like it's huge. The scene's crazy. Yeah. Did so you met people? Did you run into language barriers playing like performing in the different countries? Because people speak English, but it is still the second language for the most part. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've been to Europe, I don't know, four times or something. And but I'm just saying, like, as an example, when I was in London, I thought there was a bigger language barrier there than when I was in Japan. Because really? people in London spoke so fast because they assumed that you speak the same language so you would know. And the slang's different and it's just like really, really quick. Mm -hmm. Didn't think there'd be a language barrier, but there is. Same way when I was in Scotland in Glasgow, it's like a pretty thick accent. Yeah, where it's it was Scottish like, accent's like, this isn't English. Dude. Right, what that's is what this? I'm saying. So I would, <laughs> I would imagine being a stand-up comedian that it would be kind of mm -hmm. hard because you couldn't, not that in the Midwest, or at least you don't have like a really thick Midwest accent, but mm -hmm. still I would think it would be hard to relate with people you have to talk slower for sure when you're performing it's yeah. like and you have to enunciate and you have to use like be really clear with descriptions like i think it was like but i think that it was crazy good for like my brain for my stand-up like at that time to have that happen like i was only like two or three years into my stand-up career where i had to it was a huge mental pivot because it was like oh these are all these are people who not only english is their first isn't their first language uh they're also like culturally different from me in a way where like their beliefs are different so it's like it's like we don't really think about that when we're performing in minnesota that it's like when i'm saying something that has like a a general i don't I, like like i can't do my jokes about guns in europe like because people right. are just like they just don't because it's it's funny in the u.s because it's something that we see on a daily basis you know it's something that we interact with and something that we need 
to find humor in because it's a problem. Um, you know, it, or maybe it's not a problem, and that's yeah, where the jokes. It's are. relatable though. Yeah, yeah. like we. Un- I understand what you're saying, but when you're over there, your life leading up until that point isn't really relatable to all the people in Europe because you didn't live a life similar to that. So how do you yeah. even find? Like, where do you go with jokes? Typically, the point is to use your own life story, mm. right? Um, that's how it's unique and kind of build off that. But you're not relatable being someone from Minnesota that just was transplanted to Germany. That's what's hard about it, dude. It's like you got to find shit that is relatable because it's like, and I mean, like this last, like the, the tour that I just did, like, I would say like the, it was like, a, even though I was performing in Germany and like learning this and figuring it out, like so much of the set that I've built since then I've been building it in the US so when I got to Germany like my first show in Mannheim Cologne in Dusseldorf I was like oh no I don't have like where it was like work you know like where it's like I don't have this figured out I am not conveying this in a way that makes sense to these people like and and but then like you know after like I was just like dude you gotta pull out You know, like, it's like, what is actually funny about this in like a kind of like a human level, like where it's like you don't need any context to understand what's funny. And then how do I build up to that in a way that like people in each city would understand? Like, but also it's like we're not that different. It wasn't like, you know, terrible. It was just like there are some where it's like my like my my closer was like a build up about my dad and being from like a small town and like the way that like being queer and, and him I like it's like he can't understand my queerness i can't understand his obsession with guns but maybe we just have to meet in the middle it's kind of like the what i was like what i've been working on and then i got to europe and i was like oh this just isn't even a people here don't have guns and they don't care you know so it's just like it's not that it's like uh that they don't understand what i'm saying it's that they don't have an emotional connection to it because it's just not something they deal with so it was like oh i have to find things that it does not matter where in the world you are. People think it's funny um, for a, a tall woman to be dating a short man. You know, sure, I realized, yeah. I was like, all right, that's universally funny. So I, that one was kind of my like, because it, it's visually funny. Uh, it's something that does not matter where you are. You've seen it and you've laughed a little. Right. So it's like, yeah, finding that. I feel like that'd be hard even in America, though. Right. Because the culture is so different from like Winona versus like New York or Seattle or whatever. It's very different crowds of people yeah. that would, you, would be watching you. It I it felt like that before. But then after I came back, when I Europe made me be like, Americans are like Americans. We're like, yeah, we're not that different. <laughs> yeah. Especially here. Like in the whole world. I don't think we're all like that. There, there's so, right. so much we have in common. But like in the U.S., it doesn't really matter we're 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 a, we're a certain type oh totally yeah I've, i think <laughs> i've been to 11 countries now or something in 36 okay. states i've traveled a lot and it, it's funny like in america we're so polarized on different ends of the spectrum on all these issues mm. that we think like you know I, whatever side you are on most people who listen to the show i think are relatively liberal but like whatever side you're on you know you have people talking so much shit that they're just they hate you and it's like well we all kind of suck like if we go <laughs> over to europe they hate all of us and yeah. i get why like we're in they it's normal us, for us i gotta say europeans you know they talk shit in america yeah. but it's like i know europeans like a lot they, they fuck with america still I, I think i think it's a um <laughs> this is gonna be weird to say it's like Kanye West, but <laughs> I think <laughs> they they know that like we're loud and obnoxious, but they also like the confidence and swagger that comes along with it. Yeah, <laughs> at least that's how I felt <laughs> when I've been there. If that makes any sense at all, I think they find us interesting. Like we're like yeah, a zoo yeah, yeah. to them. <laughs> like, I don't think it's respect, but it's right. Yeah, yeah curiosity. Yeah. yeah, we're definitely entertaining. So, what was it like when you got deported and coming back here? Was it like a okay? Well, I was making money there, so I'll just it'll for sure work and I'll make money in America. And was it a a surprise when you didn't make a bunch of money when you came here or how did that transition work? Well, I didn't want to come back. I was having a good time, you know, in Europe. And I like, I really enjoyed kind of, I mean, it was getting rough, like where it was like, okay, I was supposed to move here for this program and I don't have any bases here now to like work off of. Like I was like a, basically a homeless comedian, you know, like, but it, it was, I had people to stay with. So it wasn't ever like that bad, but coming back to the u.s i felt pretty like i i was in a depression for sure like where i was just like i didn't want this how did this go like this like this wasn't and my i was still recovering from my knee surgery so i couldn't like do a lot of the things i wanted to do and it was it was tough Um, but you were in germany for a year 
So didn't you have surgery? I was only there for six, seven months. Oh, okay. Six, and you had surgery right before you left America, I would assume like then? Like four months before I left, which was so dumb, dude. I don't, I can't believe the surgeons didn't tell me that that wouldn't work. Like that, sure. that the rehab would, cause like, I, well, it was like my third knee surgery and the first two, um, I was like playing basketball within six months. So like, it was like, I was like, oh, it'll be the same. But this one, I think was just like, because it was like a transplant, like, yeah. and and because I wasn't like an athlete who was like working out all the time, I, it was just like a, like, I was fine um, through the, like the kind of end of the summer and stuff because I was able to ride a bike a lot and had like some strength training and stuff. And then as soon as it got cold, like my shit got <laughs> sure. not doing good. Um, so it was like, just like rehabbing my knee and hoping that you know stick but but it was weird like within two months of being back is like when my social media just kind of blew up so i was like well i guess i, I don't know that that worked yeah you know, i started posting reels when i got back to the u.s sure you gotta move your knee <laughs> you're good <laughs> so yeah so you how when you moved back here did you just where did you even move did you just move to minneapolis with some friends and couch surf till you found an apartment or because when you got deported it was relatively quick turnaround right yeah. it's not like you could have lined up a job and a place to live and all that stuff in that time it frame. was crazy kind of how it worked out like i found a apartment on facebook marketplace that was only 300 bucks like in in minneapolis yeah like right by like the lake it, it was like no how? way and then i mean it was almost one of those things where it's just like i kind of got beat to shit in europe a little bit from like the and like the knee and everything it was tough and it felt like you know there is some kind of higher power they were like they were like here you go buddy you know here's a little oh, like yeah. landing pad sorry yeah. things have been pretty hard um yeah 300 bucks rent uh, so i could actually like afford it um and i didn't know the person that i reached out to on facebook marketplace but then i ended up knowing both the roommates were people i used to like hang out with and i'm just like so i just ended up living with two people that i knew by yeah. chance um very cheap rent and was able to kind of like get it together from there. Did you have like a little bit of a lump sum of money saved up from <laughs> performing out in Europe or no. did you get a job right when you came back? I got a job. What were you doing? I was like serving. Tables. Oh, serving again. Okay. Yeah. So then how did the social media, uh, so I, I forget, I think I was talking to a comedian. I, I talked to so many people and I'll say it was a comedian in this analogy, uh, but they said that <laughs> their full-time job is social media and they do comedy for fun but like really like that's was just the analogy of how much uh -huh. how important that particular part of the job is and it's i've talked to a lot of comedians that are just like so against it and i totally understand because you see these people that blow up i'm not saying you blew up off social media and weren't a stand-up comedian because you were but there's all these other people that like blow up doing skits or whatever you know what i mean and then they build a social media following so then they get booked to do shows but they're not stand-up comics yeah right so they, they don't really know where to go with it and then you have the other side of the spectrum where these people you know they performed all this stand-up comedy and built the name for themselves and then social media became such an important tool and they didn't want to play the stupid game because i get it like Everyone I know who does social media doesn't actually enjoy doing the social media. No, yeah. It, you just like, you recognize that it's an important part of it. So mm -hmm. you learn how to get good at using that tool. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, so what was it that worked for you to be able to have social media kind of take off? Like reels were being pushed in general, but like yeah. you just cut any random clip or I, why did it work better for you than most people, do you think? I don't know, dude. It's still something where I'm just like, because there's so many funny people in Minneapolis. Like, I, I mean, I... Cause like the graphic design background, like I knew how to edit video. So it's like, I, and like, I was, uh, thoughtful about, um, you know, like framing and I edit the color a bit to make it, you know, warm. Cause I like, like to, I like the art of it. Like the, sure. like the video editing has its, I add like, you know, like a little flair to it. Like where I just like, you know, well, I have like a specific color grading that I do for each clip. And then I put the subtitles in the same place um but i mean honestly i the the clip that went like viral and i get, got like thirty thousand followers just from like one reel which was just oh, like whoa. it was wild like it was like uh i i just like decided because other people were posting clips and it's like okay i'll just post one a week i'll see what happens i didn't really have any expectations and after five weeks one of them like ended up with like a million views and like at thirty thousand followers I was like, what the fuck? It was so weird, dude. Wow. Like, it was like not. Um, it went viral because I mean, it was. I think the combo, um, if from what I've noticed from like the range of the clips that I've posted and what what ones have like kind of, it has to be funny, you know. Obviously, like right. it, it does have to be funny. Um, 
and it has to uh be like really quick like uh, like a uh, from the you know it, it has to have something that it it opens with something that makes people be like what you know so people actually watch it right um and it has to cause people to say negative things in the comments <laughs> um that will cause other people to comment back and defend uh me <laughs> sure <laughs> because that's the if if people if somebody comments something ignorant in the comments i'm like let's go this is about to go viral bro because <laughs> it's like it's it's the it's fucked up like social media is hell i think like yeah. it's just like a place for people to argue um and i uh, but i don't really you know because people argue in the comments most people who see a clip aren't looking at the co- they're just liking it and be like yeah you know that's right. nice so whatever do, do your thing keep commenting appreciate yeah. you guys for having my back when uh <laughs> people <laughs> comment something obscene at me it's really nice yeah i uh i've man getting into the youtube game more recently i've realized how horrible just the internet is you know on instagram i've only gone viral once which was like a quarter million views of my dog i like did a skit where i interviewed my, interviewed my dog as mm. just a random dumb joke and it kind of took off didn't get thirty thousand followers i fucking wish that'd be cool <laughs> <laughs> i think i got like 400 maybe or something i don't know uh-huh. um <laughs> but anyways I, i've been posting to like on instagram the vast majority of the people who see the things that i post are people that already follow me yeah you know versus on youtube it's like 99 percent of like the views that come from a youtube short are not people that subscribe to me Mm -hmm. therefore it's people who don't view me as a person and don't necessarily like me or care about me so it's way more uncensored and just way more awful and people love to like tell you how wrong you are even if you're not even if it's something that's like a perspective like a political thing or something that you say like people Mm -hmm. come out of the woodwork and just say horrible things i interviewed um mandy teats she's like a feminist influencer kind of uh person she speaks on a bunch of like liberal issues she was actually just at the white house not long ago which was pretty crazy kamala harris's office like had her come out yeah i know it's i don't know it anyways uh but i like i knew when i edited that interview i knew it i was like i'm gonna get so much hate on the internet from this even though i agree with her but yeah. like I just knew that was what was gonna happen. And sure enough, like the YouTube shorts from that episode were just like the most horrendous things that Awful I've ever feeling, read. Dude. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it was hard for me. Like that was the first time because it's relatively new. I've been getting into that portion of what I do. It was hard for me personally to like keep seeing that all day long. Every time I check my phone, there was like five more really horrible comments. And like that really was draining for me. Does that not bother you at all? Um, it did for when it first happened because it was so new and I didn't have any like framework to deal with it because like and also I'm like, you know, it's like in it's kind of wild to have that happen when you're just like a stand up comic in Minneapolis, like where it's like I don't have anybody around me who can be like, hey, hey, buddy, like this isn't that big of a deal, you know, like, so I really had to just figure it out on my own, like to just it took probably I'd say it probably took a year to like truly be at ease with the amount of uh, observations that are yeah. at my disposal. You know, like it's because that's what it is. It's like everything I do and put out, it filters through somebody else's head. And from what they have going on in their head, it that's how they interpret it. And it's scary to know that you don't have full um control over how somebody like perceives what you're saying because it's like in my head i mean this like this but somebody who's you know has a certain belief system hears what i say interprets it something in another way and then they just go off with what they feel and think um and it's out of my control so i try to just like like if i'm gonna post something i need to like believe in it because it's if I post something that I, I don't fully believe in and then, then it starts getting negative comments then I feel bad because I'm like, yeah, I don't like it either. You know, sure. <laughs> like, but like if it's something that I believe in, then it's like, I just don't care because I like it and I don't read what I only read what people say if I'm insecure about what I did because I am like doubting myself and I need to. I'm looking for other people's opinions, you know? So it's like, if I'm yeah. doubting myself, then it's like, I will look for other people's opinions. And that's how I know. It's like, ah, you didn't, you didn't mean what you said, or you didn't, you're not behind this, or this isn't goofy. This is you trying to do something that's not authentic. That's really interesting for you to actually put it in that like perspective. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, 
but it's hard to have that confidence when you're 25. <laughs> you know what I mean? That you know what you're talking about because you grow so much as a person. I'm still growing all the time and I'll mm -hmm. be 34 uh, next month. But like your perspectives and stuff change all the time because you learn new things all the time where you yeah. look back on yourself a year prior and you're like that thing that I used to say or believe was definitely wrong. I just wasn't aware of it yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I feel like it would be difficult to have the confidence to go, no, like I don't care what these people say. I'm impressed by that because I, yeah. I, I struggle with that a lot. I think I know what I'm talking about or I believe in the things that I say, uh -huh. but it's still like, I, I guess I'm just not desensitized enough to it yet for it not to bother me. I try to only speak on things that I like really feel like I've taken the time to understand, you know? Sure. So it's like, which I know, like I probably, you know, being 24, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'll probably in like five years look back on stuff and be like, what was that, dude? Sure. But I'll be able to look back at myself then and be like, okay, but that person really believed it. Right. So. So believe in the things you say on the internet. <laughs> so you started to blow up on social media because you had some things go viral. I think um, what you are very right by just having good quality makes a world of difference, right? It's like mm -hmm. when somebody sees somebody in like a Netflix show, that person's immediately a celebrity just because they were on TV. And yeah. part of it is just the perception of that. You know, like part of the perception is how many followers do you have? But when something's produced well, which mm -hmm. you can realistically for social media kind of just do on your own. But when it's produced well, people auto automatically like assume there's more value there and they think it must be more of a real thing than it necessarily is. Yeah. So they're more apt to follow something like that in the future versus like I think there's other comedians or just people in general who are very successful, but they're older and they don't have a creative director that's helping with anything. And they put out content and on social media, even though they are really good at what they do, it doesn't look like that. And they're not successful then in that realm. Yeah, I've met people like that. And it's pretty funny how that works. Like Chris Cruz, is a friend of mine. He uh, he's from Barron, Wisconsin. He got second place on the show, The Voice. Uh -huh. So he's like a big country music guy, right? Yeah. On Facebook and stuff, he's huge because he's a country musician but he's two years younger than me and like on instagram and stuff he has no idea what he's talking about so i had to sit with him and his manager and like kind of and i don't know that much but like tell him mm. this is why this isn't working for you yeah, yeah you yeah. know what i mean even though he's really good You're at posting it. posting pixelated selfies you weirdo <laughs> dude for real though there's a lot of people like that so i think when you put the effort in and you have it like look professional it's quick that people are gonna want to hop along with something like that yeah yeah and I think it's just like easy on the eyes, you know, like it's like you want stuff to be like, I mean, it's like art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> like, for sure. Yeah. The, yeah, I definitely think there's like some like, yeah, it gives like legitimacy to the production. And it's just like if something is terrible quality, I'm going to turn it off because I'm like, I can't look at this. This is like hurts right. my eyes. How do you film it? Do you have somebody in the audience as a friend do it? Do you just set up a camera like we have here and then you kind of frame it later? Or how do you do it? I'm so bad at filming my own, my own stuff. I really struggled like with like just getting any footage in Europe because like uh, setting up my own cameras and stuff. I get the best videos come from places that like because like most like clubs in the area like have cameras set up so and then they just like give you your video oh um, wow it was awesome that like comedy corner underground like minneapolis club um they kind of like started it like like bob the owner he rules you should interview him he's interesting sure um, he uh uh like just like was ahead of it you know he was like i think reels are gonna be a thing tiktok so i'm gonna put cameras in the in the basement you know he was more so actually thinking that he was gonna film specials for people and stuff um so he, he installed some super nice you know like black magic 4k cameras we were getting crazy good footage and then wow. because of that i mean like my that's like where my videos that um went viral came from because it's just and and it's like a great mic like on and like a, a great like like their their Friday 10 p.m. open mic. If you're in Minneapolis and you've never been, you gotta go. It's ridiculous. It's like it's usually a pretty good time. Um, and then the shows on the weekends are awesome. Uh, so like, it's just like a great space for comedy. And then to be able to capture that on video, like, and not even have to think about it. Like, we don't have to set anything up because I think I don't. It, it it fucks with my head when I'm like thinking about videotaping something. Like, it's like I yeah. just want to like be a part of the space and then the space includes a camera i don't want to be like thinking about like you know setting up to capture something so i can edit it later like that's really i don't want to be thinking about that at all when sure I'm performing. Like, but i don't think most people have that opportunity right i don't think that many comedy clubs do good quality audio and video and just give it to you for free like that's they do charge you five bucks but well, five. <laughs> 
whatever. I'm just saying, like, that's a pretty it's, awesome, awesome situation yeah. to be in. That's not like common. Yeah. You know what I mean, because like, you know, like Acme does it, but they only give you your tapes if you're like a employee there, like like a MC there. So like, okay, I get video from Acme now because I work there. But like, that wasn't. I didn't work there until I got hired there in like December. Um, so like comedy on state does that in Madison. So when you do, I mean, comedy, there's obviously, there's a different, a lot of different lanes. Um, but for something like social media, it has to be something that's short and digestible. It can't be a story arc thing because people don't understand perspective of like why this is even going in this direction. Do you write jokes kind of differently for social, like with the intent of I'll film this and this will work on social media or not really? Um, I kind of know which ones are going to be social media jokes. I don't like to, re- I don't want to post any stories or anything that like it involves plot, I guess. Cause right. like, I don't want to ruin my, I don't want people to show up to my show and already know what's happening. Like, uh, like if this, someone comes and sees me live, like I want the, the jokes that go on social media to kind of be like r- little snippets, like almost cause, and then cause that's what works also. So it's like right. more of like a anything that's on my social media is pulled from like a chunk like it's like all of like the little i mean yeah i posted i've posted two jokes recently that i just don't believe in i'm debating taking them down oh, uh, okay but i don't think i'm going to because i think i want my mistakes to be visible um because i don't want to scrub things you know like where it's sure. just like i, I want to be real um but like because i think from now on what i want to do is like really just like have like if i'm building up to something then i'll start posting something every week but if i'm not building up to something then i'm only gonna post something if i like i'm like oh this is awesome so you don't try to keep to a schedule at all with posting of like i need to have this many jokes per month posted or anything like that i was doing that for a bit like where i was like post once a week and i've noticed that is like a thing where it's like if you post once a week there has uh, something in like the algorithm like eventually one of them goes viral like it's like a consistency thing helps i think um but not at the cost of the art yeah like i don't want to be putting stuff out that i don't that i think is bad because or like just for like to meet the standard because there's so many clips being posted all the time like everybody's posting clips like i only want ones that are gonna like make people be like like that that represent what i because i want people to come see me live like that's what i'm using the social media for like i don't that's only purpose so it's like if this i think this would spark curiosity and get someone in the door and if i'm working towards like like if i when i do like another tour then i'll start posting like two months before i go on tour because i want something to go viral so people are paying attention to what i'm doing um but if i'm not working towards something then i don't want to be burning my material online yeah yeah no i mean that makes a ton of sense it's just hard to stay like today's attention span it's really hard to stay relevant if you aren't really consistently popping up on people's things they forget about same thing happens with podcasts like i paint murals all the time like i told you earlier so i don't like episodes will come out every week but not necessarily all the time i don't have a boss nobody tells me i have to do anything at any Mm -hmm. point in time so if i'm really busy with several paid mural projects i might not record an interview for a month because i'm busy doing other things you know what i mean but i have definitely noticed if i take kind of breaks between episodes coming out it takes a little while for that momentum to come back again yeah because i was in somebody's regular rotation of once a week they gave that time but since i wasn't there now that time and attention went elsewhere Mm -hmm. and i have to like try to lure them back in which is a really difficult thing to do to like keep the integrity of what you want to create you know what i mean but also like post and play the game the way that you kind of have to play it Mm -hmm. it's a little bit frustrating i have a couple gifts for you can i give those to you yeah do you mind cool do you like coffee you do right because you do love coffee yeah dope okay coffee and a boot (laughs) yeah i know this is this is yeah european christmas market thank you for that Uh das boot (laughs) okay so this coffee is from minneapolis actually Uh oh yeah well it's from honduras these beans are um but you can find minimum wage tim uh he's from he went to school in eau claire but he lives here in minneapolis uh, although I think he's in Indonesia or something right now with his uh, girlfriend, which is pretty crazy. Awesome. But anyways, um, they serve this at a bunch of places in Minneapolis. And he's kind of trying to uh, get out of just the Twin Cities, but hopefully you enjoy it. It's full this is a coffee. great brand. Minimum yeah. wage, Tim's. I like the, like, whoever did the drawing fucking crushed it with that. 
Okay. Um, so we also give away a bag to somebody listening. So all they have to do is follow Minimum Wage Tim on Instagram and then DM the password for the episode, which I didn't write one. So let's say the password is American Cream, <laughs> since that was <laughs> <Okay>. your <laughs> tour. Good password. And then I have one other thing for you. Uh, Mayana chocolates are from Spooner, Wisconsin. This I'm and I I was eyeing those up earlier. I'm saying one. this, but this is actually true. These are by far the best chocolate I've ever had in my life. Like for real, it was the kind where like I you bite into it and then you like close your eyes because you're like, oh my god, what in the world? Yeah, super good. They make a bunch of different ones, um, but yeah, the chocolate factory is in Spooner, Wisconsin. So cool. pretty dope to work with uh, another Wisconsin company. You can find them at myonachocolate.com. Use promo code Passion for twenty five percent off. So let's talk about the American cream. <laughs> how did the, uh, good how good did, transition. Yeah. How did the uh, tour line up? You booked all of it yourself? Like what was, how did you even plan it? Uh, I planned to do like five shows was like the initial, like I wanted to go back to um, Berlin. Like I knew like I, I knew I could like set something up there. Um, Lisbon. Cause like I, I had a friend that I met in Berlin who moved out there and started a comedy club. Uh, Istanbul I just like really want to go to Istanbul always and I um, saw that like there was like a comedy production like group like that was like already following me on Instagram so I was like oh no way I'll hit them up uh, and then like Cologne I had like lived there and produced shows there Switzerland yeah I had five shows like that I was like okay I'm gonna do this and I like I'm in Prague I had like a friend in Prague who like uh, they, have, they have a really cool comedy club in Prague Metro Comedy Club <laughs> <laughs> rules um, they I so like I had a few shows and then I just like decided to do that because I just wanted to go back to Europe. So I was like, OK, to go back to Europe, I got to like make a little money like while I'm there. So I got to work. Work vacation. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I viewed it and then um, I uh, posted those out and then just had other people reach out to me, like asking me like like someone like like a this like group in like Vienna. They're called Gays and They's Comedy. They, they were Sick. fun. They reached out and were like, yeah, do you want to do a stop in Vienna? And I'm like, I would love to. Um, and that one was really awesome. A friend in Amsterdam. Uh, I was like, dude, you got to come out and do a show in Amsterdam. And he produced it for me. That was dope. Um, basically, got paid half in weed, which, you know, it's whatever. Sure. <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll do it for the for the fun, for the yeah. fun of the city. Um, and then, yeah, just Barcelona added on. Um, Those would get added on when you were there or all of this was pre-planning. So you knew how many days and all the stops and stuff. I knew when I would. I basically was just like, okay, I'm going to be in. I bought like tickets to be there for like seven weeks i was like i'm going i'm going out oh. for a minute i want to go yeah. like i didn't think of, i didn't think that hard about it i just was like serving over the winter and i had some money saved um and i knew that i could like set up some shows so i was like let's just a few um and then i started to get like i was like oh i could like really kind of fill this up if i wanted to so i did and um because like the touring circuit in europe is like pretty accessible like i mean the clubs are just very flexible and like open and like we'll have you and um yeah so it just kind of turned into like a whole whole thing did they promote a lot of it themselves because it's kind of hard if you don't necessarily have fans in istanbul to like say i'm gonna have a show in istanbul and have people show up even if you have a social media following it's not like you're the following has a big percentage of people there you know, you'd think, but I guess I've got fans in Istanbul. I sold out. I don't know. Like, really? I, yeah, they they do a good job like promoting. Like yeah, they okay. put a lot of uh, like the the stand up scene in Istanbul is actually crazy good. It's it's wild. Like um, the comics are super funny. Um, like English speaking, and there's Turkish speaking. Like they in in every European city, it's like it's kind of interesting because there's two scenes. There's like an English scene, and then there's like whatever the native language scene is. Like you know, Barcelona, Spanish, and um, Germany berlin um but in istanbul it was like yeah you can do an english show every single night of the week and they like just like produce shows for like like the twos bear english comedy produce shows for um like daniel sloss and jimmy carr so okay. it's like and then they do a bunch of like local kind of solo shows and then they do people like like me like coming through like they set up shows so was it relatively easy to get booked for all these things just mainly because you could Instagram DM them and like that was kind of proof enough as far as like, oh, this is worth people's time? Because unfortunately, that's a lot of it these days when you're trying to get booked for things. You know, like I told you about um, Landon Conrath, who was a guest of the show, who's a Minneapolis musician. Mm -hmm. um, he struggled to get booked at like small venues periodically just because of social media. Yeah. Even though realistically, like he sells out way bigger venues at other places. It's just sometimes people 
exclusively look at Instagram to decide whether or not, you know, what your worth is. Yeah. I mean, I, it's probably a factor, but yeah. they care less about social media in Europe. So it's oh, like, okay. it's just not as much of a part of their day to day lives. So I don't know if it's the same level of, I'm, I mean, I'm sure that's a big help. Um, but but those people don't necessarily know you or haven't seen a full set of yours. So what else do they have to go off of? A lot of the people I did know from when I was like living in Europe. How um, many shows did you to do in total on the tour? 15. And you knew people at all 15 of those spaces? No. Oh, okay. I would say, well, because I did Seattle, Minneapolis, and Chicago before I left. Um, and you're including those in the 15? Yeah. Oh, okay. And then Europe was like, yeah, there was 13. Yeah, sure. Because, um, yeah, I mean, it's probably the social media. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> how, do, how do you, how do you uh, negotiate? Like when you, I mean, I know you had said you had a manager, but a lot of times I think you just have to be flexible and I'm sure you're aware of that. But a lot of people have like a, this is the base amount I charge for a show, you know, and they think that's just how it works, which maybe if you're within the same country, mm -hmm. then you could say this is the base amount. However, when you're traveling between different countries, you know, somewhere like Europe, I'm sure that the amount these different clubs pay is just different. You can't really just say this is the amount that I charge for everywhere that I go, right? Basically, it's just like, you know, I get 70 to 80 percent of door sales tickets. So. Oh, it's all just on door sales. It's not like it's a quite flat the risk rate. that I did that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that it worked <laughs> out. Yeah you, ended yeah. Up, you ended up having a successful tour, right? Would you call it a success at the end of all of it? Yeah. At the end of all of it, it was a success. Uh, and then I got robbed. <laughs> I lost a bunch of money, which was like, okay. Um, like mugged? Or what I, do you mean? Someone took my bag off the train, and then I also lost an envelope of uh, Turkish lira just for being a dumbass. Um, but, yeah. you know, on paper, it was a profitable tour. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Came so, back broke, but I did it, you know, if I wouldn't have, you know, if I wouldn't have lost money on accident. Sure. Well, now that you're back, what are the plans? What's coming up? I got to I'm I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing cuz I mean like the tour was a I loved it. You know, I had so much fun and like through doing the shows in the cities that I did um I now know people in the cities that I didn't do. So like I've got a kind of like a in Europe you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Like my like you know like one of the producers was like, "Oh, I did produce a bunch of shows and you know like in the north you know like like so i can go back and do like norway denmark and like finland and the uk and stuff um so i'm gonna i'm gonna try to do that in the next year um i'm like headlining at comedy corner uh which i'm super excited about because i'm doing like the full weekend there like the uh, like friday saturday that's in minneapolis yeah cool may when 31st and june 1st cool um and that's been like i mean since i started doing stand-up has been my goal to like that's like the holy grail of minneapolis I mean, it's like the alt holy grail. It, sure? <laughs> it's, it's my holy grail. Yeah, I would okay. say like cool. I, other people, maybe I don't know how they feel about comedy corner, but I love it more than anything. It's, um, it almost means, I mean, the world tour, so sick, so cool. But the comedy corner headlining a weekend there kind of means a little more to me. Like where I'm just like, cause that's when I, sure. when I started doing stand up, I was like, if I do this, I made it. So I'm just like, I'm excited. As of May 31st, I made it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not yet. Hopefully nothing happens, right? <laughs> yeah, man, hopefully I'll make it there. If I die before then, dude, that's fucked up. I really hope not. Um, but uh, I'm doing Rip City Comedy Festival in Portland. That'll be interesting. Kinda when see. is that? Uh, it's May 4th, 5th, and 6th. Oh, right after. Okay. Uh, or right, yeah, in like next week. Um I think I'm, I'm doing a show. Oh, yeah. Sorry. May 31st, June 1st. You're right. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Going to Kansas City, like, end of May before the... There's all... There's dates on my Instagram, MD Comedy. I'm basically... What I want to do is... I think I want to relocate to New York. I think. I okay. want to... I want to see what that's like. Um, but overall, I just want to... I want to try to perform in every city in the world. Isn't it hard to do that when you don't have a car? Like a lot of comedians would travel kind of road trip around, right? At least at this kind of stage of their career, because yeah. it's expensive to fly to each location and rent a vehicle because America is not like Europe where there's just trains everywhere. No, and it's yeah. not, not convenient to just go to Kansas City. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I don't mind taking like Amtrak and stuff. And then when I get to a city, I just walk. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's how you're going to be able to make it work. Or fly, you know, but 
you know, people, I, that's why I do need to go to Chicago or New York because I really, I don't, I don't like having a, having a car and yeah. 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 Well, especially if you're going to be gone as much as you are, mm-hmm. then you have to worry about getting hit. Right. That's how you lost your car. Yeah. It literally just a drunk driver in the middle of the night. It, it, like I wasn't in it. I was, uh, I have ring camera footage of it just plowing. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Every time I'm in any city, but specifically like in Minneapolis, cause I drive here relatively often for things. Uh-huh. I'm always worried about parking my car in the street. Like I did today. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, God, I hope And I drive a garbage vehicle. Like mm-hmm. I paid off my car nine years ago. I'm not, it's trash, but like, I still don't want to walk out and have it totally smoked by somebody. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully that didn't happen. Okay. We're towards <laughs> the end of the episode. I always ask the same question every episode. So hopefully uh-huh. you have a story. So try to think about the story. If, if you need time, I can give you time. But when you do things that you're passionate about for a living, you get to have really unique experiences, such as traveling Europe and meeting new people in Turkey, right? Mm-hmm. What's a story of an experience that you had that you're really grateful for, but it only happened because you pursued comedy? <sighs> and not just all the people I met along the way. This is why it was worth it to go on a tour that went well and then get robbed of all earnings. Um, yep, exactly. <laughs> they ran up my card at Foot Locker, dude. I'm like... <sighs> And you couldn't have that, like your credit card company yeah, wouldn't reverse those that. charges. Yeah, it just was, you know, at the I time, had to yeah. Rush okay. order my passport, and you lost up. your passport too. Yeah, they took my bag, my passport, and my cash, and everything. It was, oh my god, really not cool. Um, but you know, made it back, and I'm okay. So whatever. Um, okay, I guess there was uh, when I was like the first time I was in Europe when I was in Berlin. Um, I did a show at this place called Cosmic Comedy. Uh, and it was like it has worked because it was a really fun spot um, in Berlin and like there was just like all these people that I just kind of just met um, and we were all like outside like smoking cigarettes and then we were like let's go to another bar and we all crammed into an Uber and went to another another bar and I was just hanging out with comics from like all over the world like all like we, we stayed out until like I mean, you know, Berlin doesn't shut down until like 6 a.m. So it's just oh, like, God. and it's just like these people with like such crazy life experiences that have all brought them to the city and have brought them to do like the same art form. And we're all, we all have different accents and we all speak like in from such different uh, perspectives and backgrounds, but we're all funny. And it, just to like be in that environment, I just, I do remember like, at this like shitty bar in Berlin where we can smoke cigarettes inside and there's like a, a old techno DJ. <laughs> like I was just like, this is so cool. I love that my life has led me here. Yeah. I can't, I guess the closest thing I have to that is I stayed at a hostel for the first time down in Costa Rica this past winter. Uh-huh. Never did that before, but being in a place where everybody's there just strictly to have a good time, but yeah. from all over the place, like, all different countries and everything we went out to a club like i don't do that at all but that's where everyone wanted to go and i think there were 11 of us there was only like i don't know two other americans but they, like it was like 11 of us that yeah. all went to this crappy little club that was like we took up a lot of the club <laughs> but it was pretty cool i ended up meeting a lot of different people and then every night it was like at, you know several of the people that were at that hostel every night it was there last night so you got to go all out you know what i mean and it was like that the whole trip and you just get to meet a ton of cool people like that that's what you get when you get to when you put yourself in a position where you're not lux you know in your own hotel room and everything you're like pushed with all these other people but they're all the coolest people you know and you can relate in uh in different ways i didn't get to do it with comedy but maybe soon and when it's like it's just like this weird feeling of being like we're all from like so far away, but we all have so much in common. Like we're different, yeah. but like we like all like really can just like that. You can just like hang out with yeah. a crew of people from literally every section of the globe. And it's, we have it's, like things to talk about. And, it's like the most organic networking too, yeah. because now, you know, comics in all these different places. So now you have an excuse to go to all these different places. Yeah. And it's like, I, the, the thing with stand up, it's like starting to feel like it's like, it's not even networking. It's like people just become friends. Right. And it's like, just be friendly because that's how, that's what, that's, cause that's what makes it fun. Cause it's yeah. like you're going back to, cause like my shows in Switzerland that I did with like, uh, like Teddy, like we, we met in Berlin on that night. Like the, like they, and it was like two for three good, I'd say. Like, yeah. like one of the shows was tough. Um, but it was, we, we were hanging and it was like, just like great to see him again. So it was like, that's what this is about because there's always going to be bad moments in it but the people make it good 
But is, I, I think that's what good networking is though. Like when you think of the term networking, it has a connotation of it's like, it's very business. Like what yeah, can you do for me? The, like the connotation right, of the word. That's right. what people think of. And that's bad networking. Yeah. Good networking is surrounding yourself with people that are like-minded that you're going to enjoy being with because you want to work with people you like. Like uh -huh. generally speaking, like people hire people for things, especially when you kind of like are self-contracted, any kind of creative thing, anything like that. But people like to hire people that they like being around and like working with. So by intentionally putting yourself in a place where you're going to meet other people like that, it's not specifically what can you do for me. Yeah. It's just these are I'm going to put myself in a position where it's much more likely I'm going to meet people that I enjoy being around. And there's a good chance that something may come of it. Not mm -hmm. that I'm going exclusively for that reason, but that very much is like a side effect that you're aware of. And it's kind of dope, you know, versus like it sucks when put it this way like when you have people hang on to friendships way too often i think personally you meet somebody you get along really well you have this like cool relationship but then as time evolves and moves on you have literally nothing in common anymore and you mm -hmm. have to go so far out of your way to see this person that those relationships kind of fall off because they were built when it was convenient when you worked together or whatever so you had these things in common you don't anymore but by being more intentional with where you put your time, spending time with other comedians or whatever, like I said, it's not necessarily like, I'll go here and this is what's going to help me get booked by these things. But you have these things in common. Those are friendships that realistically have a much higher chance of carrying over in the future. Maybe I'm looking at it way too analytically, but like yeah. that's kind of how I view it. Yeah, I think that is like a good way to like, to because yeah, it's just like proximity. Right. You know, like... Um... I mean, it's starting to become a thing where it's like, I mean, uh, most of my friends are stand-up comics because it's like, it's just proximity. It's like, right. it's who's near me? But yeah. Those are the people you're spending time with anyway. So that's what's naturally going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's the same way, like I mentioned with the show. It's like, I meet all these different creative entrepreneurs is how I guess I like to put it, whether it's an artist, comedian, whatever. But I meet all these people all over the place for a long time. Like I said, I was traveling to LA, which those people aren't even from LA. They're from all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. So I've just kind of built this like huge network of cool people that wasn't an intentional network. It was just like, I interviewed you. We got along well. There's other people I've interviewed that a like- different word, like webbing, maybe. Webbing? <laughs> you know, like spider webbing kind of, or like, you know, community building is like a nice way to say, yeah, say but networking, I want a new word. All right. Well, we'll figure that out for round two in a future date. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me in uh, your party basement. <laughs> <laughs> it is such a party basement. Thank you for uh, listening to my life and yeah. asking me questions. This has been cool. I can't wait to see you come to Eau Claire and perform. I think I'm actually, I might be back pretty soon. My friend's like doing a show at the Plus there on Thursday, like what their Thursday show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you're going to come along just to hang out and then surprise do a set. Yeah. All right, killer. Cool. Then everyone can see you. I'll help promote it on the Instagram so that way we get the plus chock full of people. Although it already is on Thursdays anyway. I want to do a weekend there. I feel like I could. I definitely think you could. Colin would promote the shit out of it too. I should do that. I'll hit him up. Cool. Well, thanks again. Cool. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon. <laughs>